Okay, welcome everybody um, this evening to the third in our series for nature's sake, which is a series of seminars that the Sussex Wildlife Trust is running prior to COP26. And the, the, um, the webinar this evening is going to look at how do we live in a changing climate, so particularly around adaptation and resilience. Um, so with, there's a Q&A function, so there will be some opportunities to ask questions. Um, there's kind of limited wind windows in the program. We really will try and keep it to the hour as well, not, um, not extend it. Um, so we're gonna start off with Matthew Bird from the Sussex Wildlife Trust talking about the um, UK climate risk assessment. And then this is going to be followed by Nick Gray from the Environment Agency talking about climate change from a statutory body perspective. And then we've got um, three internal Sussex Wildlife Trust speakers talking about nature-based solutions taking place here in Sussex in a range of different environments. So um, without more ado, I welcome to Matthew Bird. Thank you very much and over to you. Thanks, Henry. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, so this is the, as Henry said, it's the third in our, um, in our COP26 webinar. So I thought I would just give um, just a very quick overview of um, what COP26 is, just for anybody that hasn't been to any of the other webinars. So it's the, um, it's the climate, Global Climate Summit that um, is in the news a lot right now. Um, and it's being hosted by the UK in, in Glasgow, um, where it's hoped that we're gonna get some firm and positive action. So we're gonna see if uh, 196 nations will deliver or not, um, whether it's gonna be a good cop, bad cop, and you know, whether they're going to actually set into play all those promises that were made at the Paris Climate Talks in 2015. So, um, you know, essentially it's, it's setting the world, um, it's setting out plans across the world so that we'll deliver um, and keep temperatures within a 1.5 degree uh, rise um, of our pre-industrial levels um, by the end of the century. And, um, you know, the way that things are, um, we're currently between three and four degree rise. So um, there's a lot to do. And in terms of that, I just thought I couldn't really not mention the um, net zero strategy that, that was released today. So, you know, this kind of gives us a, a very clear indication of um, what the UK government is going to do in terms of delivering those, those ambitions and aspirations. So um, it's, it's quite long. Um, I have, haven't been through everything, um, but you know, there's a lot of, lot of information, a lot, a lot of proposals um, with various sums of money um, around things like decarbonisation of homes, um, electrification of transport, um, uh, hydrogen, um, and that at the moment is, is, is more around the, the sort of fossil fuel kind and not, not the renewable kind. Um, and, and to nuclear, um, and, and there's lots of other things in there. Um, and the idea is, is that that's going to um, you know, reach that net zero carbon target uh, by 2050, the government set out. There are some, some uh, nature-based um, proposals. So there's an extra 124 million for the Climate for Nature Fund. Um, and there's a plan to restore um, 280,000 uh, hectares of peat by 2050 and, and to treble um, woodland creation rates. Um, and that's to contribute to the, to the national target of planting 30,000 hectares. So it, I mean, it feels like um, there's, there's some good things in there, but it doesn't feel like it's, it's covering everything. So I can't see anything um, around food or around climate vulnerability. Um, so fuel poverty is a big issue that we're going to face. And obviously at the same time, the government has, uh, has released a program around um, heat pumps. So this is looking at, at installing heat pumps in 90,000 homes over three years. Um, but currently we have 25 million homes with boilers uh, that will need to be upgraded to electricity. So there's a lot to do. So really what I wanted to kind of um, talk about in the context of tonight is around adaptation and just you know as a backdrop um, I think 2018 this is taken from from the um, climate risk assessment 
um, carried out by the um, Climate Change Committee. So there's one every five years, and this is the third one. Um, and and what, what this says essentially is that, you know, we're already facing um, climate change. So, you know, you, you can see those numbers. Um, 2018 is what, what we expect will be a typical summer by 2050. So this is at the moment highly unusual, but this will be typical. Um, so during that, you know, we'd be looking at summer rainfall um, decreases by as much as 24%. Uh, we'd be looking at winter rainfall increase uh, by as much as 16%. So, you know, with consequent droughts and floods. Um, and obviously the, these are going to bring significant changes to, um, to, uh, to our economy, to our natural world, to society, to our well-being. So, you know, hopefully we'll see if today's um, announcements will, will take us closer to that 1.5 degrees. But, you know, as I said, we're currently on with, with current policies around uh, between three and four degrees. So, um, you know, I, that, that would mean a significant increase on some of those, some of those figures and some of those impacts. So, so taking the, the climate risk assessment, I really wanted to focus on, on uh, four out of eight um, key areas that the, uh, the Climate Change Committee identified. Um, you know, in a nutshell, the report was saying that we just, in terms of adaptation, and resilience to climate change, we're just not really prepared. Um, so four of the eight areas that were sort of identified as being you know, really high priority are directly attributed to, uh, are directly um, related to nature. Um, and if, if you look at that, that um, infographic, the, the red, the dark reds are the kind of high priority and you know, the orange is sort of less priority, but becoming higher priority uh, through that timeline. And you can see there in the first one, the, you know, the risks to the viability and diversity of, of terrestrial and freshwater habitats from multiple climate hazards. I mean, e nature provides many, many different ecosystem services, you know, whether that is uh, sequestering and storing carbon or, or, or water supply or flood mitigation or, or cooling, you know, that's a really important um, adaptation service. Um, and climate change, you know, to add significant threats to, to these functions. So overall, the, bio, the, the abundance and distribution of UK um, terrestrial and freshwater species has declined by 13% since 1970. So if you add further climate impacts to that, then you know, there's some serious issues there. Um, Soils and the second one, um, you know, soils is a vital part of um, our healthy ecosystem. Um, soils sequester and store more carbon than the atmosphere and all, all the ground biomass combined. Um, it's a rapidly, um, you know, broadening area in terms of, sort of understanding just, just how significant soils are. Um, but they're under huge threats, uh, you know, whether that is being compacted by machinery or building or buildings or you know, other human pressures. And again, climate change through um, heavier rainfall, which causes erosion or and compaction and drier conditions, which you know, cause surface layers to, to be blown off, can have significant impact. And we don't yet know what higher temperatures, what, what you know, especially if we're talking around three degrees, what impacts that will have on the ability of soils to sequester and store carbon. Um, so the third one around the risks to our natural carbon stores and sequestration uh, by habitats, um, you know, they face, um, you know, rapidly increasing threats from, from multiple climate habits, habit, um, from multiple climate threats. So, you know, what, what we see at the moment is that, you know, different habitats sequester and store carbon in varying amounts. And, and again, you know, that's, that's, um, we're, we're, we're understanding which habitats sequester what in, 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 in much more um, confident ways now. So I think at the moment we know pretty well what peatlands and um, broadleaf woodlands and salt marsh sequester and store. Um, and so again, through pollution, and degradation and um, other damaging um, practices such as peat extraction, and rotational burning, 
you know, these, these habitats are already under increasing um, um, threats. So if you add hotter and drier conditions to that and, and, and floods, then, you know, again, the ability to sequester sort of goes down dramatically. And maintaining these stores is absolutely critical. And it's one of the most critical sort of nature-based solutions to climate change, um, you know, as, as we move towards 2050 and, and especially beyond. Um, and then in terms of our um, livestock, and crops and you know, agriculture, um, climate change poses, poses a direct um, threat. I mean, there's also opportunities there as well, um, but through increased temperatures and heat stress and drought risk, uh, and we've seen you know, increasing um, fires, uh, heatland fires, um, then you know, again, uh, there's threats there to, to the ability of agriculture to, to, to deliver on our, our food supply. Um, and you know, I think we need to be looking at, at nature restoration as, as part of agriculture and, and look at how resilient the current practices are. So the government will respond to this in, um, I think it's in January, in January next year, um, when they produce their third climate change risk assessment. So you know, hopefully post COP, uh, that will be you know, fairly robust and meaningful response. And uh, I'll, I'll finish there, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, we have got time for a, a couple of questions. Um, so we don't have any in the Q&A at the moment. So people do um, pop questions in there so we can come back to that. So thank you very much, Matthew. And um, I'm very pleased to welcome our next speaker, Nick Gray from the Environment Agency. Hi, Nick. Who's, Hi, going, to, who's going to be talking about the climate emergency and COP26 from a statutory authority perspective. So over to you, Nick, thank you. Super, thanks. I'm just gonna load up my presentation so it gives us a second. Okay. Hopefully that's working. I'm gonna take the silence as a yes. So- uh, Yes, that's fine, thank you. <laughs> Super, thanks. Hi everybody, I'm Nick Gray. I'm the Flood and Coastal Risk Manager for the Environment Agency. Uh, I cover some of the south of England, so uh, Sussex, Hampshire, New Forest and the Isle of Wight. And uh, in, in less than 10 minutes, we're going to have a, a whirlwind tour on what's climate change looking like for, for coastal management and what are the problems we're facing and what are some of the solutions that we're thinking about now. So when we talk about climate change, we generally think about sea level rise, uh, and, and that is a problem. It, it's actually probably not the big problem for flood defences. Uh, what is a big problem are the storms. So a lot of our beaches, as we'll see, are managed with uh, uh, transient solutions like shingle and pebbles, and uh, more frequent storms gives us less and less time to uh, fix those defences before the next storm comes which means we're less and less resilient to, to whatever storm comes next. Uh, with an increasing height in sea levels, we get more waves and uh, waves bring an awful lot of energy and destruction to, uh, to our defences. So uh, storms and waves are a big problem. And the whole system, the whole hydrological unit has just so much more energy in it, uh, storms and waves and sea level rise just creates a, a, a harder and harder system to, uh, to manage uh, with the ways we've always done it. And on top of all of that, we have less space. We've got the higher sea and sea pushing closer and closer to, to where we're used to living. That's gonna squeeze something and something's gonna lose in that situation. So I'm just gonna look at two of the more traditional approaches to uh, coastal management, and we'll see uh, what the problems are with those. There are, of course, a hundred different ways we manage the coast, but these are the two that are the most regular. So uh, just a quick uh, touch on what we're actually doing. So we spend an awful lot of money on flood defences in England. Between 2014 and 2021, we spent £2.6 billion on, on flood defences across, across England. Uh, some of that's on our rivers, but as, a, as an island nation, most of that was on our coast. And with that money, we reduced the risk to 300,000 houses. The, the graph on the right, that 5.2 billion is what we're currently spending for the next six years. So twice as much money, 
but actually we're not doing very much more with it than we did with two and a half billion. And that's because it's so much harder. We're already seeing the effects of climate change. And that means everything we're doing now is more expensive and harder to build. So this is Seaford Beach. I wanted to choose a picture of a local uh, beach that acts as a flood defence. Um, it would have been easy to go Brighton, but everybody chooses Brighton, so I thought I'd choose Seaford. And what we don't think about very often is the beaches that we go out for our ice creams and our sunbathing is actually a flood defence in the winter. And when people aren't there, we've got trucks running up and down the beaches, moving the shingle uh, from one end to the other as the sea moves it. And that, for Seaford, as an example, costs us about 400 to 500,000 pounds a year, every year, just to keep that beach where it is. Now that's kind of affordable at the moment, but that's gonna get harder and harder with sea level rise. In fact, here is an example of a place where it's already really tough. I have purposely chosen uh, a site that is not in Sussex, so there's no fear mongering or disasters, but the point remains, this is a shingle beach when the sea's not there, and that sea is high, it's got lots of waves, and it's really, really close to those properties. That is a future that we're going to have to get more used to if we want to keep the shingle beaches in the summer so we can all enjoy the, that coastal environment that we're used to. What about rocks? So these are the only, these are the other obvious solution. And from an engineering perspective, rocks are brilliant. I buy them in, they are big, they are heavy, they don't go anywhere, and they don't really fall apart. Uh, that's a picture of Pagan Beach, uh, just to the west of Bognor. Uh, we put those rocks in 2015, and those houses are there today because those rocks are in place. But rocks are not very appealing. If you have rocks, you generally have a lot of rock, and you have a lot of concrete with it. And that does not scream a particularly uh, environmentally friendly solution. It certainly goes in the face of, of the Environment Agency's commitment to net zero. And I don't think we have a lot of people there enjoying that beach in the summer. But that's a serious uh, issue that we're going to have to think about if that's the solution that we want for our coastline. So there is good news. Uh, the picture on the left is uh, a place called Medmory. It's south of Chichester, just to the west of Selsey. If you've not been, it's the most special place in Sussex. Uh, I, I, built that, so I probably would say that, but it's well worth a visit. It's probably the most recent nature reserve that uh, has been created in Sussex. And what we did was we built seven kilometers of flood defenses, but set back. You can sort of see it snaking around the bottom of the screen and then it disappears off to the right. And we've just made space for water. We let go of our existing defenses. We let it roll back over the farmland, which we bought. And since we bought that in 2013, there has been no flooding, no money, no money spent, but what we do have is an amazing diversity of birds, of fish, of uh, amenities. So many people come to visit Medbury. That's a really wonderful example of uh, adapting to climate change uh, through nature-based solutions. The picture on the right is kelp. I won't spend too much time on that because we're going to have some presentations later talking around the virtues of kelp, but it's something that we are seriously investigating for its flood risk uh, properties. So there are plenty of things that we can do, but they look really different to what we're used to. And on that note, I think I'll just leave three questions for us to consider. So if we don't want to change, are we prepared for more frequent flooding? Because that's the reality we're going to face. We can't keep building things bigger and bigger. Or are we prepared to change our use of our coast? Do we want to lose the shingle and tourism and just stick a lot of rock? Or do we move people away from the coast? Or finally, are we prepared to trust natural solutions? I've seen the amazing benefits that things like memory, realignment, and kelp can do, but that's a big ask for communities who've not seen that to say, we're moving away from traditional rock and shingle and concrete, and we're going with a more natural solution. So uh, this isn't a formal uh, consultation, but uh, you're the people who are going to be benefiting from this. I'd love to hear any views people have uh, because these are the problems that we're all going to be trying to solve over the next 5, 10, 20 years. So that's me done. Thanks, Henry. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, I think there are quite big questions, aren't they? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, um, as we haven't got any questions in the q and I'm going to have a chair's prerogative question. Um, which is about what 
how we, how does the environment agency receive opposition to plans? What's the process where you get local communities inputs and what has surprised you or disappointed so, you? Or yeah, there's two answers to that question. So the, the formal answer is we frequently need planning permission. So there is a statutory process where people can, uh, can engage and consult and give us their views. Uh, and obviously that's a, a decision for the local planning authority if those defences go ahead. But we like to be better than that. Um, and what we like to do is bring communities on the journey with us from the beginning. Uh, we know that a flood defence that costs most flood defences on the scale we were talking about are tens of millions of pounds. And that is a bad investment if I just turn up and we build a flood defence and say, aren't you lucky? What's much better is to design something with the community hand in hand. So there's something for people to use, be proud of. Uh, we've got an amazing project starting in Eastbourne and Pevensey at the moment where we're looking to do that to bring people along with us. So, yeah, we try our very best to bring people along with us from the beginning. And uh, if all else fails, you can usually uh, uh, tell us what you think through our formal planning applications. OK, thank you. And uh, another chair's prerogative question. <laughs> um, to You said that it's not actually sea level rise per se that the, is the issue, but the storms from... Yeah. In your role in the Environment Agency, what what are you seeing in terms of the change in storms and wave height? How do you measure it? What's how do you learn about these things? So uh, the 2014 Valentine storms, going back a few years, is, is a brilliant example. We saw uh, we 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 classify storms in return periods. So uh, a one in two hundred is kind of the most extreme storm you can imagine, and, and we expect to see that once every two hundred years. Um, the Valentine storms were like a one in 20, so fairly, fairly rare, but not peculiarly rare. And we saw that time and time and time again throughout uh, January, February, March. And what storms do when they when the waves come on, they rip the shingle away from the beaches and they live in that kind of mid, mid shore area where they're just sitting there in the sea being turned around for weeks and weeks on end. And if we have another storm before that shingles get put back on the beach, we can't build that beach back. And so the standard of protection is, is reduced and the, and, the, and the crest width gets smaller and smaller and smaller and the overtopping and the flood risk increases. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that in how frequent we need to go out and, and repair beaches over the winter. Gone, it used to be we'd go out before the winter and after the winter once each time to fix a beach. And we're now seeing we're out more frequently because the storms are just coming. There's amazing, for if anybody loves numbers, the Channel Coastal Observatory monitor all possible uh, wave, uh, sea level uh, data. There's a wealth of information on their website uh, that you can, you can extrapolate loads of information from. Well, I think you're on mute, Henry. Sorry, we have a question. You mentioned Eastbourne and Pevensey. How do we mm. find out about that? Uh, we have a website. I should have come prepared. Um, I can send you the link. I, if you, I, I'm hoping if you Google Eastbourne and Parency Flood Defences Environment Agency, you'll find our website. Um, if not, I'm really happy for my email address to be shared after the event and people can contact me for more information. But uh, yeah, it's a really exciting project and we'd love to have as many people engaged with it as possible. Thank you, Marion, for that question. And um, one final question, Nick. With COP26 coming up with your work hat on, and as your Nick not at work hat on, what, what would you like to see? So uh, let's do my not work hat on, because that's really easy. Um, uh, the letters in the front of my name when I was when I had the opening is, uh, is my professional status. So I'm a charter member of SIRA, which is the Institute for Water Environmental Managers. I'm a passionate environmentalist. Um, I do an awful lot away from work to try and create a more sustainable future for us. And one of the reasons I'm so glad to come tonight. So my non-work hat on, I would love to see so much more commitment and, and what did Greta Thunberg say? Policy this, policy that, blah, blah, blah. It's a little bit of that, isn't there? So let's put some, let's get some reality to, to solutions because you can't wait. We cannot wait for 2030, 2040, 2050 to come along. We see it now. People need to uh, get on and make solutions. And I, I'm, I'm very mindful of not ranting, but there's an amazing TED talk where it was a comms guy. And he said, the trouble with scientists and engineers are you're terrible at explaining things to people. 
if we described climate change as a pollution blanket surrounding the world that's going to overheat it and kill your children, people would probably be moving quicker than they are now. And I'd love to see us get into that space. Um, uh, for my work hat, I think I'll probably be a little bit more considered in my views. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to squeeze in a, a question from Brian, um, because it is really pertinent to what you've been saying. The stretch of coast between Brighton, Brighton and Rottingdean has groins. Do they reduce the cost by keeping the shingle in place? Can you explain a little about the role of groins? Yeah, of course. So um, if anybody can remember from their, their kind of geography, O levels, A levels, GCSEs, um, when the sea comes, it comes on kind of like an angle, it doesn't come straight on to our sea. And so it will pick the pebbles up and, and then move them slowly along, long short drift. Um, so without groins, uh, they would move across the coast in a sort of unrestricted way. And that means we have to go further to collect them. So absolutely, the groins are there to keep the shingle predominantly where we want it. And it just makes it easier for us to go and grab them and move them back towards the bay. You'll generally see the groins are on a on like a slope. Uh, beaches are designed to have like a a 10 meter crest width at the top and then like a one in six slope to, to, to ease it down to, to the sands and these groins are designed to keep those bays as they are. So yes, timber groins are there to keep the shingle where they're supposed to be. There's a whole equation and, and, and analysis on how often do the groins need to be to reduce how often your machines need to go out to move the shingles. Um, but again, I mean, just as some context, it's about a hundred thousand pounds to put a groin in. Uh, if you're looking at rock groins, they're a million pounds. Um, so there's a lot of money involved in coastal management. Goodness. And for any of us who thought that our beaches were a lovely natural space, we've now learned that they're actually completely they're not. It's really interesting. If, if you took away the shingle, you'd have small cliffs. Um, so Worthing's a really good example. If you got rid of the shingle from Worthing, you'd actually just have a cliff from the promenade. Um, and, and most beaches want to, re want to roll back and create sand, but because somebody two, three hundred years ago put a little village there and we start putting defences, we stop beaches forming. So where you have sandy beaches, that's predominantly because we've allowed space for the beaches to roll back. Absolutely fascinating, Nick. Thank you so much. Um, please stay with us because we'll have some questions at the end and I'm sure there'll be more questions for you. Thanks. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to move on to the, the next section of the, today's session, which is looking at nature-based solutions that are happening here in Sussex. And our sp first speaker is Glenn Norris, um, who's a reserved ecologist with the Sussex Wildlife Trust. And he's going to be picking up on a topic that in our last webinar, Dr. Tony Whitbread picked up on, which was the importance of natural regeneration in woodlands. And Glenn's going to do tell us about natural regeneration, illustrating it with a particular site. So thank you, Glenn. Hello, everybody. Um, some great talks already. Um, but as Henry said, I am uh, Glenn Norris and I'm gonna, I'm the uh, reserves ecologist for the trust, which means I, I look after the monitoring strategy across all of our reserves. Um, but today I'm gonna pick out the example where the trust has used nature-based solutions to create a incredible habitat which is both in excellent for biodiversity, but also has potential to store much more carbon than, was, than what was previously there. And uh, that project is Butchlands. Um, and this, uh, this project started 20 years ago now, in 2001, um, where the Trust had the chance to buy 80 hectares of mostly arable fields. Um, and this land is right next to Ebeno Common, uh, that you'll probably know just near, near Petworth. Um, and as well as the arable fields, it also had um, a few minor features like a small copse, uh, a few hedgerows, a ditch, um, and a couple of uh, mature roos as well. The, uh, these are field boundaries that allowed commoners to move stock between different areas and are often well wooded. Um, so here's the area. It's this big circle shape uh, on the top right, and also the three fields in the bottom left, um, all within the, the red line. And it's situated, as I said, pretty close to 
Everlo Common, which is just on the left there. Um, but generally, the surrounding land use is pretty poor, and it's all um, it's it's mostly mixed uh, mixed farming with a network of hedgerows um, and the odd small woodland uh, woodland cops. Now, the uh, the interesting thing I want you to notice here is the field margins, and you can see where this farm has been in. Um, has had set aside land along the margins where they haven't ploughed it and uh, it'll be interesting to see the difference that makes in these, the, the images I'll show you later. Um, and to the, the national, the nature-based solutions that the Trust are using focus mostly on natural regeneration and grazing and that constant battle that's been going on since the start of time and will con continue to go on if we let it. And uh, essentially that is vegetative succession where land wants to go from bare earth to grassland to scrub to woodland. And that's where it wants to stay. And then there are the, all the forces against it, which uh, for the purpose of this talk is mostly grazing, grazing. Although things like windfall and storms also help um, create open areas as well. The aim was to create wood pasture. And um, this is, best done using grazing um, because it allows certain areas to wood up but also maintains a check on it so that it doesn't just become one big block of wood and it allows trees to have the space they need to grow to their full potential and uh, the reason I've called this process is, is because there's no aims to this project it's seriously a, 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 a centuries-long project where we're just allowing it to go um, as we see fit, with the limitations of making sure we have an even mix of open vegetation, mostly grassland, uh, scrub, and then woodland as well. So back to this first image, um, as well as the grazing, we also um, restored a bit of the wetland as well. So the ditch is on a little elbow um, along here, and it was just a boring regular ditch. Um, but we blocked it up, creating temporary wetland features. And Sam, who's going to be speaking next, is going to be talking to you about how important wetland features are. Um, but just so what happened in the last 20 years since we had uh, since we took on this site? Uh, well, aerial photography got pretty bad. Um, but other than that, you can see the difference that intermittent grazing has had. And uh, just to cycle between the two images, which I'll do now, if you focus on the edges, you can see that they filled in really quickly. And they became, they became pretty much solid woodland within the first 10 years because that land hadn't been ploughed as heavily as the centre of the fields. And this is where soil health is really important for um, the regeneration, the natural regeneration. Because the soil was still intact and there was still all of the, the bits and pieces that make it work, it meant that trees had a far easier time of developing and growing. Whereas some fields in the middle, like this one here, has absolutely, it has barely anything in the middle. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting how that has worked out. And just to make it slightly clearer so that we don't have to rely on 2018 aerial photography is uh, a map of the scrub. So the peach is the grassland, the green is scrub, and the purple is woodland. And you can really see there how much uh, the scrub and woodland has expanded. And just to give you some numbers, that's the area, the amount of area that's changed. And uh, there's two really important things I want to get across with these two maps. And the first is, it's not just area. Although area is good, the one big win win winner is edge habitat and this is what where your diversity explodes because you've got the mix of grassland and scrub edge so you have a whole host of different species that rely on those two different things and as well as specialists as well and they all come together and you have this enormous uh, boost in biodiversity in these areas and the amount of edge habitat went up by 550 percent in 17 years so it went from about seven kilometers where the grassland borders on scrub and woodland 
to just over just under 50 kilometers uh, around all the scrub that you can see all those tiny little patches have got edges that are absolutely brimming with life to the extent that now in bramble thickets we're getting nesting Dartford warbler which is as far as I'm aware never been recorded before and the other point on this is that it was all natural regeneration we didn't plant a single tree and uh, of course that has so many benefits for so many reasons and it's, and it's, it's quite obvious really there's a there's no carbon cost there's no there's no cost of growing these things in a, in a nursery there's no soil you know there's no there's no risk um, there's no risk of diseases coming in from from local nurseries there is no carbon cost associated with volunteers coming to help us plant the trees there's no transport costs there's uh, there's no um, there's no other diseases all these trees are locally genetic they're, they're, they all come from the same seed source within this area which means that they're all designed and evolved to to work on these soils in these particular conditions around Petworth and it's really important that we have that um, because trees that come from different different areas of the country aren't going to survive as well and the other thing is that it comes with a much much better vegetation structure if you're plunking in a load of trees it's going to take a long time before you get the same amount of structure and uh, biodiversity that we get at this site but I think the most striking thing that I found was that the most recent survey of oak saplings so this is just oak it's not even rare things like the wild service tree in this picture uh, there were 25,000 oak saplings recorded within the six fields in, within the 80 hectares 25,000 if these were bought from the local nursery that would cost somewhere around about 20 to 25,000 pounds uh, which is a huge cost save us but it's, it's cost us absolutely nothing. You know, we just let it grow and have a few cows there to keep it down and slow it down. So what are the, what are the conclusions from this? Well, the removal of this area uh, from arable use and then into uh, new wood pasture has massively increased diversity. It took 15 years for orchids to turn up. Um, turtle doves and nightingales are off the charts. And uh, fungi as well, really important fungi are, are turning up in the middle of the field. So the soil health is, is massively increasing, but much more is needed. The uh, natural regeneration is definitely a long-term alternative to tree planting. We don't have to plant them all immediately. And the cost of, um, and I would, I would say that it was better in the right places. Natural re regeneration is certainly the right way to go. Um, it tends to be more suitable for land that is of low ecological value. It's really important to make sure that by allowing land to scrub up, you're not losing any important species or habitats. So on some of our reserves where we have important habitats, such as the Torp Diamond, this uh, is not a suitable approach. And if there's, if there's land near you like this, then uh, I would not recommend it. And it's also important to know that even though this site is 80 hectares and quite big, it's about the size of the eight, you know, about 80 football pitches. Um, it is not, um, it is not the same as abandonment. It's regularly managed in the way that we take stock on and off the site. Um, and this, we do this to mimic natural herd movements that would have um, happened under naturalistic grazing systems. So sometimes we have cows on for a long time, sometimes a short time, sometimes we have loads of cows, sometimes we have not so many. And this mix and match of approaches is what gives us that diversity over time. And eventually we'll hopefully end up with the next Devono in about 150 years, we'll see. And uh, yeah, that is everything from me. Thank you very much, Glenn. That really puts into um, context some of the stuff that we learned at the last webinar about the carbon woodlands and natural regeneration. So thank you very much for illustrating that so well. Um, we're going to take questions at the end of these three speakers. So um, our next speaker is Sam Butfund, who um, works for the Sussex Wildlife Trust on the Sussex Flow Initiative. So I'm going to hand over to Sam, who's going to talk to us about natural flood management. Excellent, cool. Thank you, Henry. Uh, hopefully you can see my presentation. Um, yeah, so 
Following on from Glenn, um, I'm going to be talking about the project that I'm a project officer on called the Sussex Flow Initiative. And it's an initiative that's been running since 2012. It's a partnership between Sussex Wildlife Trust, the Environment Agency, the Woodland Trust, and Lewis District Council. And it originally started just focusing on the northeast corner of the catchment, and it was called the Trees on the River Up project. And in 2014, this was expanded to the whole of the Ouse catchment, where we've been working uh, ever since. Um, so what is natural flood management? Well, it's less about management and more about the restoring and enabling of natural processes to occur. Uh, this can be achieved through habitat restoration and creation, uh, but the main aims are slowing water, but also storing water within our landscapes. And through doing this, we're creating more resilient landscapes for wildlife and the people that live and work within it. We're also reducing flood risks, but also delivering multiple other ecosystem services, such as improvements to soil health, increases in biodiversity, reductions in the soil erosion that Matthew was talking about earlier. And carrying on from what Matthew was speaking about at the start of the presentation, we're experiencing higher frequency of intense rainfall. We have a month's worth of rain falling in 24 hour periods. We're breaking uh, wettest year records pretty much on a yearly basis. And the predictions are that we're going to be experiencing warmer, wetter winters, as Matthew uh, mentioned, and extended periods of drought during the summer with high intensity rainfalls over a very short period. And what that's likely to be is we're going to experience more of these events that we've seen in uh, towns and villages such as Lewis, Uckfield, Linfield over recent years. And the EA are predicting that with a 20% increase in flow, that the amount of properties that are at risk of alluvial flooding within the catchment is going to double by 2100. So what have we been doing as a project since 2012 to help mitigate some of these effects of climate change? We've been increasing storage capacity within the landscape through the creation of a series of ponds, scrapes, as well as reconnecting floodplains. So we've created uh, additional storage capacity for water within the landscape of around about 12 million litres. Uh, this is obviously maintains freshwater habitats through drought conditions for wildlife. It captures rainfall during those heavy uh, summer rain events, as well as the wetter winters that we're now experiencing. We've also been working uh, to remove some historical drainage features which expedite these water flows into our watercourses as well as carrying pollutants. So we're kind of naturalizing the catchment again. So the, the process that we are going to do is to create these natural features and these photos really demonstrate the fact that we're creating these features that will blend in and fit within the landscape. So we've got the before and after photos which show scrapes and ponds with the before and then an after photo with roughly about six months between the two. So you can see how they quickly blend in, vegetate up and become part of the landscape. Here we've got one of the floodplain reconnection projects that we've done. So this is on a farm just outside of Lewis. Um, and we've ended up creating a cut through a bank that had formed over years of dredging. The dredging process um, would expediate flow down the river as well as destroying any in-channel habitat. So what we wanted to do was restore the connectivity before, between the stream and river to enable it to expand out onto its floodplain during high flow conditions. And you can see from this video, water flowing back onto the floodplain through the cutting that we've done, flowing into the scrape that we've created additional storage capacity, then flowing across vegetated floodplains, so slowing the velocity of the flow, and then eventually at the far end, flowing into a block of floodplain woodland that we've planted up. 
So following on from, from Glenn's presentation about natural regen, it is something that we, we try to promote as the first port of call in terms of woodland creation. However, a lot of our measures are very targeted in terms of their locality and also the species that we want. So uh, a lot of our stuff is planted. So over the course of the project so far, we've planted over six kilometres of hedgerow where we seek to restore lost historic hedgerows that link existing habitats, so blocks of woodland or woodlands to watercourses, that kind of thing. The hedgerows that we plant are predominantly cross-slope hedgerows that intercept surface water flow paths um, and projects uh, within Wales have um, found that infiltration rates within hedgerows are increased by 67 times in comparison to the neighbouring pasture. We also undertake woodland planting, so predominantly floodplain planting, but also again cross slope uh, planting. Uh, where possible, we seek to carry out uh, natural regeneration as shown in the top right picture. And as Glenn mentioned, there's a whole raft of benefits in terms of uh, not having to use plastic tree guards, the, the carbon uh, savings in terms of transport costs, the costs of growing and the biodiversity um, benefits in terms of the resilience of those species that are growing, being from local seed source and having the um, mycorrhizal connections with the surrounding um, woodland. Uh, woodland's fantastic in terms of natural flood management. Not only does it the leaves and branches intercept rainfall, slowing down the rate that rainfall is going to be entering our watercourses, but as mentioned previously, the roots increase infiltration rates, but also water flowing through the stems that increase roughness of vegetation slows down the flow. My, one of my favourite parts of the project is behaving like a beaver. So we're mimicking what beavers would have done historically when they were within the landscape and building leaky dams. As part of the project, we've built over 350 leaky dams throughout the catchment. These structures are generally built from woodland, uh, wood from the surrounding area and generally form part of the wider management of that particular woodland block. So it could be part of the coppicing cycle, could be a halo in around a veteran oak to in increase light levels, or it could be to increase vegetation variation in the structure within that woodland. So the leaky dams themselves are uh, vary quite significantly in their kind of size and the way that we've we build them. So on the right hand side of this slide, we've got three examples of different formations of leaky dams from the bank top diverter, where its primary aim is to push water up and out of that channel into the wider woodland to create wet woodland to a more kind of less leaky dam at the bottom, which is going to interact with lower flows. So here we can see what effect the leaky dams have when we have these heavy rainfall uh, events. So slowing down the flow of water, catching any sediment and de debris that's washing down the stream course, but also pushing it out into the wider woodland. And this has multiple benefits, not only for the wider catchment, but also for the, the woodland that the watercourse is flowing through, through the slowing down of the flow we're maintaining that base flow during drought conditions and taking out the velocity so reducing that sediment erosion that Matthew mentioned earlier so those two two videos really demonstrate the amount of water that these leaky dams can store so what we've got on the left hand side is the leaky dam following a heavy rainfall event that we experienced in 2020 and then on the right we've got the same leaky dam a few weeks later so you can see the height difference you can also see the amount of debris that has been collected you, within the video you can see how much wider the water has been pushed out by the the kind of clear 
woodland floor adjacent to the stream itself. And this, this photo really demonstrates um, what the leaky dams can do in terms of slowing the flow of water through our catchments and creating more resilient landscapes. So on the left, we've got a leaky dam that we constructed near Arden Lye at the start of October of 2020. And then the picture on the right hand side is showing the same leaky dam just 30 days later following a heavy rainfall event. So uh, you will notice from the picture on the left that the leaky dams are very leaky by nature. Um, and this is to maintain that base flow. So we've got water continually feeding downstream habitats. Also, it means that we're not inhibiting upstream migration of fish and any um, fauna that needs to move upstream. But we're the main aim of these is to interact with those higher flows and push them out into the wider woodland. So that's it from me. Okay, thank you very much, Sam, for that. Um, so I think those two have kind of led on really brilliantly and all, all the talks kind of do link on very logically to each other, but we're now going to go to a completely different environment. And I'm very pleased to welcome Sally Ashby, who is the Sussex Wildlife Sussex Kelp Lead. And um, over to you, Sally. Thanks, Henry. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Sally Ashby and I'm project managing the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project, which is a very ambitious marine ecosystem restoration project um, that ties in, obviously, being highlighted by, by the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which, restore, which, which launched this year. And there really hasn't been a more urgent need to revive damaged ecosystems than now. And probably one of the biggest challenges um, within that is to upscale restoration efforts to match the extent of habitat loss. And sadly here on the Sussex coast, we know that we have lost 96% of our former kelp forests. Um, they once spanned from Selsey to Shoreham, covering 170 square kilometers of dense kelp forest. And now there are only fragmented populations of kelp remaining 4% of the original. So we are aiming to restore the ecosystem to match that habitat loss. And one of the main factors in that loss was the impact of trawling, of bottom toed trawling. Um, so um, the Sussex IFCA um, proposed a nearshore trawling bylaw, which excludes trawling from the nearshore area. And thanks to the very successful Help Our Kelp campaign, uh, supported by the Sussex Wildlife Trust, Sussex IFCA, and an amazing film made by Big Wave Productions featuring Sir David Attenborough, that bylaw was passed in March this year. So now we have um, an area of near shore actually covering 300 square kilometers, which stretches from Chichester, the whole of the Sussex coastline from Chichester to Rye, out a kilometer, there is uh, trawling is excluded. But more specifically, in terms of restoring this historic kelp forest, the trawler exclusion zone extends out four kilometers between Selsey and Shoreham. Um, and so this trawler exclusion meant that we could launch the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project, which is um, a collaboration between all these different partners um, from national NGOs like Blue Marine Foundation and the Marine Conservation Society um, to local authorities um, and including academic institutions um, driving our research strategy forward. And, um, so yeah, so the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project is, is an ambitious and pioneering nature-based solution to restore our ecosystems for biodiversity, food security, and climate. And we're part of one of only 14 projects worldwide selected for the IUCN Nature-Based Solutions Global Standards, um, which is a real privilege to be part of that. So ultimately the question is why do we need kelp? And obviously, like other people have talked about this, this idea of ecosystem services, of, of the benefit, benefits that we get 
from restored ecosystems and particularly with kelp. Um, it provides vital nursery grounds for commercial species of fish. So obviously that's the food security element. Um, it also provides really crucial habitat for a whole host of marine species. So kelp is an ecosystem engineer providing that structural complexity and those habitats that support the full biodiversity of the marine ecosystem. And also tying in obviously with climate change, kelp forests are some of the most productive and diverse ecosystems on the planet. And it's often that productivity of kelp, the, the ability of kelp to draw down huge amounts of carbon dioxide, um, that, that means that kelp often comes to the fore in terms of climate. Um, so really just to stress here that we can't solve the climate crisis without restoring nature at scale to match the extent of habitat loss. And that really means restoring the fully functioning ecosystem. So as much as there might be quite a lot of excitement about kelp and the role of carbon, it, with it, it, the blue carbon in relation to the kelp ecosystem, it's not all about carbon and kelp. Um, it's equally the increase in biodiversity and bioabundance is as important. And obviously not just about supporting fisheries, but that full range of biodiversity. Um, and also just that obviously there are risks in themselves posed by climate change to the Sussex kelp as a fragmented and seriously decreased population. Obviously, a fully functioning ecosystem will builds resilience into our coastal ecosystem, so they're better able to respond to the impacts of climate change. Like Nick mentioned, there's also potential for kelp to mitigate coastal erosion and flooding, acting as a buffer and decreasing wave energy. And like I mentioned, it, greenhouse gas removal from the atmosphere, kelp does have a key role in carbon capture and transfer, but it's not a carbon sink in the same way as, for, for example, salt marsh or peat, which store where they store carbon in the soils and the sediments. Kelp is more of a carbon conveyor. So it will draw down the carbon. And then when the kelp breaks down and, and floats away, and sinks, um, that carbon is taken with it. It feeds the coastal ecosystems, but unlike with giant kelp, for example, in California or South Africa, it doesn't see, see, sink into deep trenches where it can be stored away. Um, the English Channel is much shallower. So we have a different sort of environment here in the Sussex, in the English Channel in Sussex. So we have a PhD plan to understand more that flow and fate of carbon in, in the Sussex environment specifically. So to give you an idea of this degraded ecosystem, the, the, for example, the bottom toed trawling changes the seabed and, and it's diminished in its, its structural complexity and its biodiversity. So this is, is a sense of, of a sort of degraded seabed um, as a result of trawling. And um, this is a photograph taken from a recent research trip to actually uh, look at an area of kelp that exists that hasn't been historically trawled to get a sense of what we might restore to. And um, here we're deploying an underwater drone that we use to, to film and, and study the seabed and how it's recovering. So I've got a little bit of footage here that will give you a sense, hopefully, um, of what we might be able to restore to. So yeah, so there you go. Um, thank you for giving me the chance to speak. Over to you, Henry. Thank you very much, Sally, and just amazing to end on that absolutely beautiful video. Now, I'm very aware that we have one minute to go for the rest of this webinar, and I want uh, Matthew to be able to um, 
kind of conclude the evening for us, but I am going to, we do have quite a few questions. So um, I think if it's okay with people, I will just do two questions so that there's an opportunity for some of them to be answered. Um, so uh, we have a question from Jenny Beckingham. Are there any flood plans for Cookmere River land, similar to the River Ouse? So Sam, that's one for you. And maybe Nick, you might have something to add. Yeah, so we've got, there's a similar project that's just started up in the Cookmere Valley, which is being led by the High World AMB. So a similar project to the Sussex Flow Initiative in terms of the natural flood management project. Um, and I'll quickly pick up on another one in terms of asking if there's similar schemes in West Sussex. Uh, another project is just starting up uh, on the River Ada, being led by the Ooze and Aders Rivers Trust. That's wonderful, thank you. And um, um, jump in from the oh, EA. Nick, yes, in. please. So, uh, yeah, uh, the Cook is a busy place. So, we are doing some sort of traditional shingle clearance to keep the river open. And starting April uh, next year, we're working with the National Trust to do a really exciting realignment scheme on the west bank of the Cookmere. So, uh, trying to make more space for that way to, uh, for the water and create a tidal prism. So, lots of exciting stuff on the Cookmere. Thank you, Nick. Um, and finally, a question from Anne. Um, so really for Glenn, on natural regeneration, how important is proximity of good quality varied woodland to the success of new woodland development? I think that could equally well be asked for Sally about the proximity of good kelp spores um, to kelp regeneration. But um, Glenn, over to you. Yeah, um, okay, my, I, I don't have anything to back it up, but I would say um, it helps, but it's not essential. The, the nearest, um, population of wild service that I know of, unless there's any sneaky ones in the hedges, uh, is about a kilometre away. So it's uh, things certainly uh, are able to travel if the conditions are right for where they land. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, first of all, thank all our speakers, um, Matthew, Nick, Glenn, Sally and Sam, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you also for all our participants for joining us. And now we've just got to watch COP26 and see what happens. So um, we'll all be, I think, as a result of the seminar series, I've definitely learned an awful lot of things that I'm looking out for, but we're going to conclude with Matthew, who has um, had, who has basically organized this whole series. So thank you very much, Matthew, for that. And uh, we'll leave with your wise words. <laughs> uh, you'll be lucky. <laughs> no pressure. Um, but yeah, no, and, and thanks. I mean, fantastic speakers as and presentations as as they all have been throughout throughout these three webinars. And um, we have got uh, a YouTube channel as well, so I think it's if you want to catch the earlier webinars, it's worth um, checking them out. Um, but I just wanted to kind of um, throw out sort of five key asks that we would, would like, you know, what we want to get back from COP twenty six. And I think I think the first one of those is. Is around um, you know how we actually approach uh, the ecological emergency and the climate emergency. Um, we've had a, a little known COP going on um, a long, uh, you know before COP twenty six with the biodiversity one, um, which I think I think it's in two halves. So the second half will be in March next year. But I think this really illustrates that a lot of um, the sort of ecological biodiversity issues have been looked at separately to some of the climate issues. Um, and I think I think the net zero strategy today illustrates that quite clearly. It's very industrial in nature, um, very much about technology. So I think that's really key. I think we need to protect as a matter of urgency our wild places. So, you know, we've we've seen throughout these webinars, you know, what a fantastic opportunity um, there is for nature to sequester and store carbon. You know, and our understanding is increasing of that. Um, so they're vital carbon stores as well as being you know, vital, vital um, you know, nature habitats. And, and I think we, we need far more emphasis on adaptation and resilience. I think, you know, everything has been around net zero and, and sequestering, but, you know, there is a locked in climate change that we're going to have to deal with because of the legacy emissions. So, you know, we really need to, to adapt much better. And, and it feels like, you know, for the last 15 years, you know, a lot of people are being crying out for that and, and we're still not there yet. Um, and, and 
you know, as we've seen, our soils, you know, it, it, they, they have a vital role to play. So we, we really have to protect our soil. And I think from a national perspective, the Wildlife Trust, you know, they're already caring for over um, 2,000 nature reserves and working with many other partners. And so I think that, that there's a real opportunity here to, um, to make more space for nature. So there is a campaign to, to increase this to 30% by 2030. So I think that's a really good, clear, clear ask to finish on. Okay, well, thank you very much, Matthew, for rounding that off. And thank you very much for everyone for attending. I'm now going to uh, close the webinar, but as um, we can't see the audience, I'm gonna just give a round of applause to all our speakers. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye.